are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. I think most of you know that I'm Terry Rogers. My wife, Carrie, and my son, Matt's here. And Jennifer's not here at the moment. Uh, oh, there she is. All right. Well, I was just going to say, she's, the twins had their birthday yesterday, and I imagine they're still doing things there. But anyway, I was glad that she's here. I don't know if she was, knew I'd be up here, and I wasn't sure if I'd be up here, but... Uh, I guess I need to go back a little bit and uh, talk about I was born and raised in Long Beach, California on uh, August 17, 1941, just before World War II. <clears throat> we went to the movies a lot when we were kids. I think some of the seniors probably remember that. And that's where you got your newsreel. <clears throat> When the wars ended, they went into the concentration camps. I can still see the pictures of these massive tractors type equipment pushing bodies by the hundreds into holes from the concentration camps. And I'm sure some of you probably saw the same things and I'll never forget it. I think even then I kind of questioned God because I didn't know him, but I knew there was a God, or I thought I knew he was a God. How could this happen that we'd allow people to do such things to other people? But we came to their rescue as a country, and fortunately we ended the war. <clears throat> Sometime after that, I'm not sure, six or seven years old I was, I went to a tent revival. I went forward. I believe God accepted me then. I didn't know that for sure. It's kind of neat, big tent, lots of people. But anyway, he's been with me for all of my life, and I didn't know it, and I didn't respect it at all because I grew up to be kind of a crazy guy when I was younger, which so many of us have done that. One of the things that uh, slowed me down, I had a bone disease in my hip at age six through nine that was on crutches. And uh, I don't remember being bullied because I could whack him with my crutch. <laughs> but my brother was pretty tough on me. But uh, I loved him dearly and I miss him. He died at an early age of 52 when I was 50. So it's been 30 years. But I was really fortunate to have such wonderful parents. My dad was just a working fool, had a gas station. I opened that, I think, on my fifth or sixth birthday, a new one. At that time, it was one of the biggest service stations in the Long Beach. And uh, he later became a U-Haul trailer guy. He was the second dealership in Southern California. But he worked seven days a week, I think, until I was in high school. So he just never stopped providing for my family, my brother, my mom. My mom was a PTA gal, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, just did all wonderful things. So I miss him so much. Matter of fact, told this story many times. My dad would, <clears throat> we had a breakwater there in Long Beach, some of you have probably been in Southern California, and he'd carry me on his back out to a fishing barge, probably a half mile or longer, in the morning, and I'd have a cousin or somebody else with me, my brother, and he'd come back and pack me back out along with a bag full of fish. And, uh, uh, he worked so much, but uh, he always found time for special things, and as we got into scouting, he used to come up at certain times. And 
he always liked to cook hot dogs or hamburgers for the whole scout troop, and he'd take a special day to do that. But uh, again, I can't say so much about my family. But anyway, up to graduation time, I think about the twins graduating now that uh, I wasn't quite sure what to do, and almost all of my friends were going on to college. I just had not made up my mind that that was the right thing for me to do. So I actually went down to the unemployment office and said, can you help me find a job? And they said, well, we help people that have lost their jobs find a job. You haven't ever had a job. And I said, well, I've worked for my dad at the gas station off and on since sixth grade. And anyway, they found that there's a aerospace industry was hiring some people, but I'd have to go up and qualify for that. And <clears throat> took some tests and everything, and one of the guys I knew was there, and he'd finished. I never even got through the test. I thought, boy, I'm, I'm really messed up on this. Anyway, the other so guy come up and they thanked him for coming, told him to go, and then he finally called my name and said, you're the guy we're looking for. And I think, I haven't even finished the test. And Anyway, I did a lot of good things, apparently, and I hired <clears throat> that job, lasted me for 11 years. And uh, I moved from kind of a <clears throat> shop guy into an advanced technical pay, and I traveled with the company for about two years, and I spent a couple years in Ohio, off and on in Ohio, and uh, uh, had a nice car, and uh, met a lot of girls along the way, and out there, and uh, was really living a good deal, and we had the rights to go into the officers club. It was a, uh, we were on an Air Force repair depot for the Minuteman guidance system. So I felt like I was a pretty big cheese. You know. Anyway, that all came to an end, and. Uh, they started laying off people in the aerospace industry, not just where I worked, uh, but all over Southern California. And the company I worked for had 40,000 employees. We had our own bus system there where we lived or worked, uh, traveled to and from the buildings were so apart. <clears throat> anyway, I got to thinking I uh, maybe I ought to go back to school and see if that would help save my job, and I did. One particular algebra class, I saw this really cute girl sitting there after her first night. And <clears throat> made up my mind to meet her. <clears throat> At that time, I was driving a Corvette, and uh, I had been parked in a professor's parking space, and I got a ticket for it. She's shaking her head. So that was kind of my opening line. How do you park in here? I've got this nice Corvette out there, and I don't know where to park. <laughs> she wasn't impressed. <laughs> she had a Volkswagen. <laughs> well, it didn't take too much longer, and I finally got up enough nerve to Asked her out for a cup of coffee, and uh, on the way she ran out of gas. <laughs> so that was kind of a strange thing. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, 54 years later, she's still putting up with me. <clears throat> Jennifer was born. Actually, Carrie was pregnant before we got married. I don't know if I've ever admitted that to everybody, but uh, <clears throat> not that I'm admitting it, but uh, we put it together. <laughs> and stayed together all along. And, uh, she was uh, the most marvelous little girl in the world. And we had such fun together and had a really neat apartment and uh, uh, moved along. And uh, I had uh, lost my job. I forgot to say that. Uh, Carrie took off work before Jennifer was born. And the day I went home, I had just lost my job. And Jennifer was born the next day. So I was back kind of helping my dad, trying to figure out what to do, and I ended up, there's a big hardware store similar to like a Walmart, and I got a job working in the sporting goods there. I'm taking a lot of time here, but just something I want to get off my heart here. <clears throat> but anyway, it was almost six years later when Matt was born, and uh, again, the pride for having these two marvelous kids, never got in trouble. And uh, we had moved from L.A. County to Orange County, and 
Finally, in Orange County, we moved to Riverside County. The whole world seemed to be crumbling, not just around me, but everywhere. And uh, it was just after Vietnam. And I thought it's time to pack up and get out of Southern California. And one of the guys I worked with in Ohio had moved into Spokane. And he said, you ought to come up here. You're going to love it. You like the outdoors. You hunt, you fish, and on and on and on. And Gary and I flew up. and. Uh, about a week later, I said, go home and pack. I'm going to buy a house. We had no jobs, but we made the move. And uh, here we are. And I went through some medical things and <clears throat> had open heart surgery. My first one, I've had two open hearts. And uh, my friend uh, talked to a, a pastor, Bob Warren. And Bob invited me to come to church. And I came by myself for a couple of different times, and Carrie come, and then the kids come, and we had not never really attended the church. Off and on through my life, I had, but I just never belonged to a church. But I knew I had a calling, and I'd come back, and uh, now I've got a daughter in charge of preschool, and uh, just does miraculous things with the kids and enjoys it. I've got a son that just does everything for the church here. He's become a better man than I'll ever be. <clears throat> but that's kind of my life, and uh, it's drawing to an end. I hope I've got a few years left. Got a lot more things to do, and I have a lot more serving my Lord. Uh, I became a Gideon here a few years ago, and due to the business and everything, I haven't been as active, and I'm trying to get back to active in that. But not quite to where I want to be, and uh, yeah. each morning I get up, I, I thank him that he's given me another morning, another opportunity to serve, and uh, we did have a great witness program at our store there for 24 years, and passed out a lot of Bibles, and uh, I really miss that part of the business, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, every day, uh, again, I'm blessed, and I, I thank him that he's given me another opportunity to serve, and lately I've just been thinking that What's happening in this world is upside down again. Not that it's ever been right, but it's had a lot of things going. And I, I keep thinking when he died 2,000 years ago, was he thinking about us being here or, or what, what was going on? And uh, uh, only our Heavenly Father really knows when he's going to send him back. But it seems like it's getting closer. But uh, we have to realize no matter what goes on in our life, how blessed we are to have a Lord and Savior. And each day, I'm so thankful that he's here. I'm thankful for Pastor and his wife. And uh, it's just a great place to be here in Colbert. And uh, I just love all you guys. And uh, I just wish you all a wonderful, wonderful life. And uh, keep having our friendships and families. And uh, it's just a real, real good place to be. And I thank you very much. Just, just because I know every one of us is probably thinking it. We love you guys. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. Oh, they'll, they'll shut it down back there. I just want to uh, kind of say to the kids, before you're dismissed, we got two things. One, the very first one is you have to listen to these type of testimonies. They're invaluable. Listen to them. Think about them because they're really important to hear how God works in our lives. The second thing that we have to do before the kids are dismissed, we have a happy birthday up there in the booth. Rachel's birthday was yesterday. So we got to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rachel. Happy birthday to you. Okay, now, as the kids are dismissed, you got to go give her a high five. So you got to come, come around and go through and give Miss Rachel a high five in the booth there. High four. <laughs> so, Terry, thank you very much for sharing. I appreciate that. And just the, I value you guys and your stories. And I'm envious that you had a Corvette. <laughs>
So last week we started talking a little bit about, I'm not forgetting anything, right? Just one of those moments, right? <laughs> yeah, what's that? Oh, the, yeah, if you take a look at your bulletins, there's some different things in the, in the bulletin, um, just kind of what's going on. We're planning a Father's Day uh, weekend barbecue on Saturday, and I'm supposed to ask, instead of people bringing food, if you would just donate some money, and then we'll get all the food together, and then you just show up. So check with me, or Rachel, or Becky, or Sarah. Do I have all the right names? Yeah, thank you. Oh, and the garage sale coming up. And Senior Saints is going to be this Friday. Thank you. And, yeah, exactly. And. <laughs> and exactly. All right. Well, after all that, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the, to the message today. Heavenly Father, we come before you again. Lord, we thank you that, um, that you speak into each one of our lives and that each of us has a story of how you did miraculous things and how you have blessed us and how you have kept us even when we don't deserve it. Father, we thank you for those stories. We thank you for those testimonies. And we ask that you'd give us courage and boldness to be able to tell others about those that it would glorify you because you're such an amazing God. You're such an amazing God. Father, help us to have the right words. Give us your Holy Spirit to give wisdom to how we speak to others that are so deceived. Lord, not that we would ever point our fingers, but that we would be able to come alongside and love and show how much you love us. How much you gave to have a relationship with us. We thank you for Jesus, your son, our savior. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here and speaks to us, actively speaks to us. We thank you. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor, not because we have to, but because we love you and we want to. In your heavenly name, amen. Okay, we, we were just opening up the first seals. We're in Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 again. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out to conquer uh, he came out conquering and to conquer. Now, I want us to stop and think about this because this is the culmination of a cosmic battle between two kingdoms. You know, I've oftentimes referenced the tale of two cities, but this is God's story, the tale of two kingdoms. You have an earthly kingdom and then you have man's kingdom. This first seal is characterized and again, I would say this is the Antichrist. There's no doubt in my mind. This is the Antichrist. The person on this white horse is the Antichrist. This is a tyrant who seeks to take freedom, possessions, resources. And then the next thing that comes after him, and that's the second seal, is war. And then famine. And then plague. And that's just the first four seals. White Red, black, and green. Because remember, in this case, when we look at the Greek, the word in Greek for pale is actually like a gangrenous green or a yellow pussy green. <laughs> Not to have a great image there, but it's something that is infected. It's something that is not going to sustain life. And I have a little side note here. And I think originally I heard this from uh, good old Chuck Missler back in the day. I think it was the first time I've ever heard it. But I've heard it before. I mean, I've heard it now since then. When we look at the four colors, can we go to the Islamic flags there? Those four colors are found on the Islamic flags. 
And I'm not trying to make an association here because maybe it's a bad association. And they're not on every single flag, but what you get is you get those four colors in the Islamic world. So especially the ones that are closest to uh, Israel, Egypt, you got the red, the black, and the white. Iran, there's the green, the red, the white. Uh, Iraq, there's all three. Jordan, all three. Um, I'm missing here. Well, there's a Palestinian flag. Turkey is two of the colors. Yemen. Um, one that's not pic pictured here is uh, Lebanon. And Lebanon is red, white, and red with a green tree in the center of it. So I don't know. Again, I'm not trying to make a bad association here. But isn't that kind of interesting that those same colors are there? And I'm not saying that it's Islam, but Islam is a religion of man. It is that image of a kingdom that is a human kingdom, not a godly one. And so isn't it amazing that when we look at that, here's another one This is really interesting. This is just like the Holy Spirit talking to me right now, is um, the Roman numeral system. When we look at the Roman numeral system, right, you have I for one, and so when you have two I's, that's two. Three I's is three, right? What do you get to make four? An I and a V, right? There's nothing in a single-digit column. There's nothing greater than the V. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So you either have a single number and then the three, or you have a single number V, and then you add three to it to get to, right? So that's the single number column. In the tens, what do we have? You have an X, and what's 50? Huh? No, 50. Isn't it a D or a C? No. L, thank you. So that's the, that's the tens column. You only have two numbers that represent the whole thing. In the hundreds column, you have M and L, right? Or M and C. You have a hundred and you have a five hundred. When we take all those numbers and add them up, what do you come up with? Six, six, six. Six, 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 right? Because five and I make six. Fifty and ten makes sixty. Five hundred and one hundred makes six hundred. Six hundred and sixty-six. Is that, is that just... Like, I don't know what you want to do with that, but <laughs> it's one of those interesting things, isn't it? Isn't it, isn't it just amazing? And how many, how many times does God speak to us this way? And I'm not saying that the Roman numeral system is the Satan or anything like that, but it is a reflection of man's creation of a number system opposed to God's creation of a number system, right? And when we look at everything that man does, it's going to be a counterfeit. It's going to be an absolute counterfeit. Okay, where was I? When we look at these seals again, you have to remember that even these seals, even though they're man's consequence on man, they're still, uh, they're still by design to draw people to God. They're still by design to get us to understand that there's a difference between this worldly kingdom that we live in and the eternal kingdom that God has for us. The Antichrist, when he shows up, he's going to come in and he's going to come in with the excuse of, oh, you know, let's have green living or we're going to clean the world up or we're going to get the Arabs and the Israelis to get along or the Russians and the Ukrainians or we're going to be able to get the people to come and get along with each other. That's what it's going to come in. He's going to come in with this auspices of really changing and helping all of us, right? But as we have talked, like Terry got up here and he gave the example of what looked like the world was falling apart back then. When he was younger, the world is always going to look like it's falling apart. It always is because we, as human beings, we look 
outside, don't we? We look at what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with each other, what's wrong with that. We always look somewhere else. And we're never going to understand what's wrong until we start to look at the inside of what sin did to us. That's where it is. If we're always looking outside, if we're looking at others or we're looking at this or that and why this is wrong, then guess what? We're going to look for the one person that's going to come in and fix it. Humanity always looks to man to fix the problems, right? We see it time and time again in the Bible. But I, have to, I, I, I want to give you the argument. That's one of the very reasons why Jesus became a man. Because God knew that ultimately when we reject him, we would turn to a man, and that's why Christ became a man. I mean, there's many reasons, like theologically, why he did. Stop and think about that just for a little bit. I'm going to read Romans, 12, uh, Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, just as sin came into this world through one man and death through sin, and so death spared, uh, separated all men because of sin because all have sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So Adam is a type of Christ. But the free gift is not like the trespasses. For if many died through one man's trespasses, much more than have the grace of God and the free gift by grace that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For the judgment followed one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift of following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespasses, but where sin increased, grace abound all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's a lot of complexity there. But Christ became man to save human beings. He became a human being to save human beings. He didn't become a cat or a dog to save cats or dogs. He didn't become a tree to save trees. He became a human being to save us. He became a human being. And that's one of the things that we have to stop and think about. Humanity has this idea of what a kingdom looks like, but God has a completely different idea of what kingdom is. Humanity constantly tries to use human aspects to create what kingdom should be. Any of us, I mean, we're all guilty of this, right? We become in charge of something. Maybe it's a little brother, right? We become the leader of something. God puts us in control or in charge of something. And all of a sudden, what do we do? We make that our little kingdom. We make it our little kingdom. We forget that God gave it to us. And we start to think, oh, I'm going to rule and reign this little kingdom. And we think we're doing what God wants us to do. But how many times in scriptures do we see people 
stopped depending upon God and started to reign their own little kingdom. One of my favorites here is uh, I'm going to read from 1 Kings 22, 1 through 9, and then I'll jump down to 17 to 19. And this is one of my favorites. It's about Ahab. For three years, Syria and Israel continued without war. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servant, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And we keep quiet and do not take it out of the hands of the king of Syria. Doesn't that sound like some of the things that are currently going on in the world right now? Oh, did you know that this area of land belongs to us? I mean, it's what the Germans did, right, in World War II. And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to king of Israel, and that's Ahab, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. So Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. And then the king of Israel gathered all the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramat Gileath, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, the Lord will give it into your hand of the king. He will give that battle into you. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not another prophet of the Lord whom we we may inquire? So simply put, you know, Jehoshaphat's sitting there and he's like, Whoa, you got all these 400 yes men. (laughs) You got 400 yes men there. Is there anybody here that's truly of God that you could speak to? I mean, these guys are just kind of a bunch of jokes. I mean, sorry to paraphrase it that way, but. And I love this line. And the king of. Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Emil. But I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Emil. I love the line. He never prophesies good concerning me. Never prophesies. Now go on, I'm going to jump down to 17 through 19. And this is, this is Micaiah's response. And he said, I saw all of Israel scattered on a mountain as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master Let each return to his home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah has said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. When we were at state track, one of the other coaches and I were over at the high jump watching these kids high jump. And there was this one young man that every time he went into high jump, the standard goes straight up, right? And then the bar goes across like this. And this one young man, every time he high jumped, it looked like he was missing that standard by just fractions of an inch. Like even to the point to where every time this young man would go to high jump, the other coach and I would just be like, ooh, dude, how close was he, right? And then pretty soon I was standing next to an Asotan coach, and the Asotan coach starts going, ooh, that was close. Well, finally, this young man hit his head on the standard. He hit his head on the standard when he went to jump, and bam, and knocked the standard down, and the bar comes down. And then the young man surprisingly gets up, and he's like, oh, yeah, that happens more than you think it did. At which point, the Asotan coach looks at me and he says, about time to change your run-up. Isn't that, isn't that Ahab here? Isn't that Ahab when he says, see, I told you, he never says anything good about me. He never prophesies the way I want him to. That's the kingdom of man. 
That's not the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of man, 100%. When we don't acknowledge sin and we think that somebody else is going to save us, we think that there's a different way That's a kingdom of the enemy of God. Proverbs 14, 10 and 12 says this, the heart knows its own bitterness and no stranger shares its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. And then verse 12, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end will lead to death. If we are looking for humanity to solve our problems because we're looking outward, it will end in death. We were never meant to do this by ourselves. It's our kingdom is we, but God's kingdom is He. It's pretty simple. Last week I touched on 1 Samuel Now I want to read the actual passage that I talked about. This is 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 7, and then I'll drop down to 11 through 18. And this is when the people came to Samuel. And this is what they said. When Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his secondborn son, oh boy, Abahiah. Abjaya, forgive me there. They were judges between Beshiro. Yet his sons did not walk in the ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So this is one of the reasons why Israel, Israel, Israelis or the Jewish people started to want something different. Because their judges became corrupt. And instead of turning to God, they turned to man. Then the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in the ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when he said, and they said, Give us a king to be judge, to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Now let's drop down to verse 11. And this is interesting. This is what God told Samuel to tell the people. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow the ground and to reap his harvest and to make him his implements of war and the equipment for his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cookers and bakers and cooks and bakers and he will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive orchards and give them to his servants he will take a tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants he will make he will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys I like how they put young men and donkeys kind of together there, didn't they? And put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you, your cry, uh, in that day you will cry out because your king, whom you have chosen for yourself, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Isn't that amazing? When you turn to a kingdom of man, it is a taker. See, these seals that are being opened here before us 
They're the final cycle of what has gone on through all of history. They're this final cycle, this final battle between man's kingdom and God's kingdom. They're the start of the final cycle. Let's say it that way. Because I think the final cycle actually is more than just the seven-year tribulation period because we got the very end of the millennial reign. There's another big battle. And I think that's all a part of this final cycle. It's going to put to an end the, the final things here. The king takes because the king cannot provide what God can provide. Right? God, our God, is a God that gives. He gives freely. He provides. How many of us can raise our hand and say, there was a time when I was driving down, I thought I was going to run out of gas, and I made it to the gas station, and I know it was on fumes. Right? Right? Because the Holy Spirit put those fumes in there. I mean, how many of us can say that? How many of us have been in a situation where we didn't have the food and all of a sudden, boom, we had food. Somebody showed up. Somebody gave something because God put it upon their heart. That's God providing. God provides and provides and provides. He provides like nobody else because there's nobody like him. But see, a king, man's kingdom, it always takes from us. It always takes from us. Uh, I don't know if I want to read. Yeah, I'm going to read this. Okay, let's just cover the next couple verses here. Revelation 6, 3 through 8. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living, I, I heard a second living creature say, Come. And I came on another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another and was given, and he was given a great sword. And again, where do these warriors come from? Are they not the ones that the king takes? And I know we've had wars on this planet since the beginning of time, since the moment Adam and Eve sinned and they fell. But again, this is the start of the final war. This is the start of the very last war. And that's one of the reasons why I know we even talked about it a little bit in Sunday school this morning. I don't believe we're in the tribulation yet. I personally don't believe. I know there's been times when I was like, whoa, are we? Could, could we be? I think we're really close. But I don't believe that we currently are because I don't see the final war starting yet. I could be wrong. I'm a human being. I think we're really close. But Verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard... A third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a black horse and its rider had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and wine. Now, this is really cool because we know that basically it's going to be, you know, the, the whole a quart of wheat and three quarts of barley. It's going to take a day's wages to pay to even eat. Right? And this is inflammation. Uh, inflammation. This is inflation. <laughs> this, is, this is the king taking our resources. Right? This is everything that Samuel had talked about. This is everything that is happening here again. And the interesting part here, the, the most encouraging part in that verse 6 is do not harm the oil and the wine, which are always symbols of the Holy Spirit. In verse 7, Then he opened the fourth seal, and I heard a, fourth, a voice of the four living creatures say, Come, and I looked and beheld a pale horse. And again, like when you look that up in the Greek, that pale means pastely green. And its rider was death, and Hades followed him. And they were all given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. Just like today, we have always been in this condition when humanity takes and takes God out of it and replaces it with something else, there's no one there to sustain. And so it becomes a taker. I have a few questions for you. In all of these passages and in all of biblical history, 
Who is the one that's warring against? Who's the one doing the warring? Is it not the enemy of God? Is it not humanity sometimes? I mean, stop and think. God never really wars against his people. He wars against the wicked, maybe, at best. But God's not the one doing the warring. Who's the one that causes famine? God doesn't cause famine. God wants to bless. He wants to give. He wants to abundance, right? I mean, think about this. We're in a time period where we're at a famine of God's word almost. We're at a point where people are rejecting parts of God's word and saying they're no longer valid. That's a famine. What is the result of war and famine? Is it not plague, infection, disease? I heard this term a long time ago, and I think I actually heard it from the History Project the very first time I listened to or watched the History Project, what, years and years ago. And the, the term is might makes right. You guys ever heard that term? Might makes right, right? If I'm stronger than you and I can put you into submission, my way is the right way, right? When might makes right, all the consequences that come with it are war, inflation, sanctions, socialism. When might makes right, death follows. But see, our God, who is almighty, doesn't work that way, does he? He doesn't work that way. No, he gives. Stop and think about this for a second. I think I've talked about this. Remember, you know, when we, if, if it was nighttime and we had the lights on, right? When you turn the lights off, what happens in here? It gets dark, right? It gets dark. But the moment you turn the lights on, where does the darkness go? Who knows, right? It's just not here. It can't be in the presence of light. And oftentimes, the devil, he tricks us into thinking that we have this mean ogre of a God who wants to punish and whip out and kill humanity. But that's not it at all. We in our current state cannot exist before an almighty God the way he is. He's not mean. He's trying to show us the way that we can exist before him because he loves us so much. We can't do it right now. If he was to show up right here, right now, not, not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, if God was to show up here, boom, we're all crispy critters. We're gone. Like, we can't be in his presence. But through Jesus Christ, his son, he is making a way for us to be before him. He's making a way. So all these warnings that we get in the Bible are not about a vengeful, mean God. It is about a loving God who's trying to show us how to get back to be with him. I remember hearing this story a long time ago, and I'm going to, you know, my, I don't know where I got it from. I can't. I think it probably came out of a Reader's Digest, right? That's my kind of... <laughs> That's my one claim every time I don't know where I remember a story. I remember Reader's Digest. But it, it was a story about a daycare. There was this daycare on a pretty quiet little town, and it was on the corner of two streets. And the daycare, when they first started the daycare, you know, this was a long time ago, they didn't have to have fences or anything around this daycare. And kids would go outside and they'd play in the yard, and it was fine. But then the city did something, this little town did something, and they ended up making those two roads that came past the daycare major roads, right? To the point that it was unsafe to let the kids go outside and be in the, in the playground area. And what did the daycare have to do? They had to put a fence up. They had to put a fence up to be able to get the kids to be safe. They had to have boundaries there. Another example would be when God gives us these boundaries in his word to help us know who Jesus Christ is. Another example would be how many of us ever make a fire in the center of our living room? Where's a fire? 
Where does the fire belong? It belongs in a fireplace. Because if you built it in the center of your living room, what would happen? You'd burn your entire house down. You'd lose everything. You'd lose everything. When we put Christ at the center and not the fire, right? When we put the fire in the right spot, when we put Christ at the center, it gives us the ability to be in God's kingdom, not our own. Galatians 5.1 says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit against, again to the yoke of slavery. Let me, let me translate this. For freedom Christ has set you into the kingdom of God. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit to a human, worldly kingdom again. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. That's the kingdom of man. That's the kingdom of man. I have another little, I think, uh, picture here. The seals, the trumpets, all the bad things is not God. It's the enemy of God convincing you of something that is not true and right. It's Joseph Goebbels in 1938, World War II, Nazi Germany. Propaganda. The enemy of God, the enemy of God is the one who wants you to think that God is this vengeful, people-hating, power-monger who wants to just punish, 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 punish. But the reality is very different. The reality is this. Here's Ezekiel 33, 11. To say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in, death, in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for you for why will you die, O house of Israel? God is not the one that wants to kill. He does not want to punish. He does not want to do these things. But let's talk about that punishment for just a minute here. When you were, for those of us that have had kids, when you punished your children, what was the punishment for? To help them, right? It wasn't to punish them because you're some mean ogre parent. When my boys, I think one of my boys, when uh, one time I spanked them for doing something bad, and I remember my son turned to me and he was like, that didn't hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's that part of you as a human being. It was like, oh, it didn't hurt. Oh, here comes another one. No, it's like, that didn't hurt. What's the logic in that? That's like, that's like going to the IRS and saying, oh, I don't think you took enough. <laughs> No, but I had to stop in that moment and I had to look at my son in his eyes and say, I didn't punish you to hurt you. I punished you to help you. I didn't spank you to hurt you. That's not what this is about. I spanked you so that you would know there's a better way. And when we look at how God punishes us individually, it's the same thing. We cannot look at our God Almighty who made us and created us. We cannot look at our God as one that would want to just punish us because he gets joy out of it. He does not. He gets joy out of us growing and learning and becoming more like his son, Jesus Christ. The final hope that I want to share with you today is found in Revelation 12, 11, and 12. And I've said this several times because I come back to it again and again and again. 
They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And I think you could take this verse and you could characterize that in any time of human history, but I'm going to promise you it gets worse. The moment that that tribulation starts, the moment that the devil is finally cast out, it will be like nothing we've ever seen before. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you confess and you believe, you become a part of God's kingdom. And you have to live in that kingdom. You have to depend upon the one that can provide without taking. You have to depend upon that. I want to look at, uh, I'm, I'm not going to turn to the scriptures, but I, I, I want to remind you about Daniel and his three friends. When they were taken from their land and put into a completely pagan area, right? They didn't become rebel rousers. They didn't refuse. They didn't like become little, like, eh, I'm not going to do that because that's not what my God said. No. They did that, but they did that in a respectful way, right? They said, oh, no, we're not going to do that. Whether God chooses to take us now or throw us in the fire, we don't care because we will not submit to your God. When Daniel was faced with that several times over and over and over again in his life, he did what was right. He knew what kingdom he belonged to, and he stayed in that kingdom. Can we be that way? We share our testimonies. We share these things so that people know who we are. We're children of God. We're children of the almighty, amazing, king of everything, God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you made a way to be in your kingdom through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, help us. Open our eyes and our ears to truth, Lord God. Help us to see what is propaganda, what is deception. Help us to stand for what is true. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be upon us and in us, that when we go from this place or we go down to have potluck this afternoon, that we would speak of the greatness of what you do in our lives. We wouldn't be worried about um, this or that, but God, we would know that you are our protector and our provider, that you're an amazing God, and that, that in your kingdom you provide and you protect. Countless times in the scriptures, we see you go before and make a way where there was no way. Father, we love you. We thank you. We give you praise in your heavenly name. Amen. Please stand as we have a last video song here, and then I'll give a little short blessing.